traducir María Luisa. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like a, bit, a little <laughs> bit more Spanish, you know. Oh, okay. Um, so let's try, let's see if we can do that. Are you ready? Yeah. Action. What, what is the Ecuadorian perspective on the United States? The sort of long perspective of, of US, US involvement. I'm, I'm not asking for a caricature of the United States, but what do, what do Ecuadorian people think about the United States and its involvement in Latin America and in Ecuador? Well, as Evo Morales says, the only country that can be sure never to have a coup d'etat is the United States because it hasn't got a U.S. embassy. <laughs> In any event, I'd like to say that one of the reasons that led to police discontent was the fact that we cut all the funding the U.S. embassy provided to the police. Before, and even a year after we took office, we took a while to correct this, before there were whole police units, key units, fully funded by the U.S. embassy whose officers in command were chosen by the U.S. ambassador and paid by the U.S. And so we have increased considerably the police's pay. However, as their salaries were coming from somewhere else, they didn't even notice. We did away with all that. But there are some who still long for those times, which will never come back. Relating to the U.S., ours has always been a relationship based on affection and friendship. But in the framework of mutual respect and sovereignty, I lived in the U.S. for four years, have two academic degrees from there. I love and admire the American people a great deal. Believe me, the last thing I'd be is anti-American. However, I will always call a spade a spade. And if there are international U.S. policies that are detrimental to our country, or even to that of Latin America, I will denounce them strongly. And I will never, ever allow my country's sovereignty to be affected by them. Your government closed the U.S. base at Malta. Um, can you tell me why you decided to close this base? But would you accept having a foreign base set up in your country, Julian? In any case, if the matter is as simple as I once said, OK, it's not a problem to set up a US base in Ecuador. We can give the go-ahead as long as we are granted permission to set up an Ecuadorian military base in Miami. If it's not an issue, they should agree. <laughs> Are you having a lot of fun with the interview, Julian? I'm glad to hear that. Me too. I am enjoying your jokes a great deal, yes. <laughs> President... <laughs> uh, President Correa, why did you want us to release all the cables? Those who don't owe anything have nothing to fear. We have nothing to hide. Your WikiLeaks have made us stronger, as the main accusations made by the American embassy were due to our excessive nationalism and defence of the sovereignty of the Ecuadorian government. <laughs> Indeed, we are nationalists. Indeed, we do defend the sovereignty of our country. On the other hand, WikiLeaks wrote a lot about the goals that the national media pursue, about the power groups who seek help and report to foreign embassies. We have absolutely nothing to fear. Let them publish everything they have about the Ecuadorian government. But you will see how many things about those who oppose the civil revolution in Ecuador will come to light, things to do with opportunism, betrayal and being self-serving. You, subsequently, you kicked out uh, the US ambassador to Ecuador as a result of WikiLeaks' publication of cables. Why did you kick her out? It, it seems to me um, it would be easier to go, well, I have these cables from this ambassador, I know now how she thinks, isn't it better to keep the devil you know? She was told this, but filled with arrogance, 
She said she had nothing to say. She was a woman totally against our government, a woman of extreme right-wing views, who still lived in the Cold War of the 1960s. And what broke the camel's back, the last straw was WikiLeaks, where she wrote that her own Ecuadorian contacts told her that the chief of the national police was corrupt and that surely I had given him that post knowing he was corrupt so that I could control him. The lady ambassador was called and asked to give an explanation, but with all her loftiness, insolence, grandeur, imperial airs she puts on, she said she had nothing to account for. And as we here respect our country, we threw her out. I'd like to say that some months ago, after almost a year of inquiry, Commander Hurtado, falsely accused in that WikiLeaks cable by the ambassador, was found not guilty of all charges. This shows once again how ill-intentioned US officials, due to their ill will towards progressive governments that are seeking change, report on anything groundless, based purely on rumours and gossip provided by their contacts, who are usually people in opposition to our government. President Correa, how did you find the Chinese to deal with? They are a big, powerful country. Is, are you swapping one devil for another in, in dealing with the Chinese? First of all, we don't work with devils. <laughs> if anyone comes up to us as a devil, we simply tell him, no, thank you. Secondly, you can see a bit of the selling out, the snobbery, even the neo-colonialism of our elites and certain media. When 60% of our trade and the bulk of the investment were concentrated in the US and we were left with no money to move our economy forward, there wasn't any issue. Now that we are the country where most of the Chinese investment in the region takes place, it has suddenly become an issue. Because the Chinese aren't that tall or reddish looking, because they don't have light eyes, they are called devils. Now, enough of that. If even the United States itself is being financed by China, how wonderful it is that it funds Ecuador. It's wonderful that it provides funds for oil extraction, mining, hydroelectric power stations. We are not only getting Chinese funding, we're also attracting investment from Russia, Brazil. We have expanded our markets and our funding sources. However, there are people who were born with a yoke attached to the neck and who prefer to go on with that level of dependency. That's it. President Correa, as, as you know, for many years, I have been fighting a fight for freedom of expression, for the right for people to communicate, for the right to publish true information. How is it that your reforms will not lead to the suppression of true information. Bueno, usted es una muy buena muestra, Julian, de cómo es la prensa. Well, Julian, you are a good example of what the press is like, as well as these associations like the Inter-American Press Association, which is simply an association of newspapers in Latin America. Many books have been written about your WikiLeaks in Latin America, the last one by two Argentinian authors featuring a country-by-country -country analysis. And in the case of Ecuador, it shows how, in a shameless way, the media did not publish those cables or news which affected them. For instance, disputes amongst information and news groups. In the end, to avoid being discredited, they reach an agreement not to air their dirty linen in public. I will read you one of the WikiLeaks documents the Ecuadorian press never published. The fact that the press feels free to criticize the government and yet it is unable to do so with a fugitive banker and his family businesses speaks volumes about where power resides in Ecuador. These are the messages made public by WikiLeaks, yet unpublished by the Ecuadorian press. This is just for you to see what we face in Ecuador and Latin America. We believe, my dear Julian, that the only things that should be protected against information sharing and freedom of speech 
Although set in the international treaties, in the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, the honor and the reputation of people and the safety of people and the state. The rest, the more people find out about it, the better. You have voiced your fear recurrent in journalists of good faith, but these are stereotypical fears that the state may restrict freedom of speech. This is hardly ever seen in Latin America. These are just myths. Please, bear in mind that here the media power was, and it probably is, greater than the political power. In fact, it usually has self-serving political, economic, social power, and above all, informative power. And it is the big voters, the powerful legislators, the mighty judges that have set the media agenda. This way, they have subdued governments, presidents and courts. Let's stop portraying this image of poor and courageous journalists, saint-like media trying to tell the truth, and tyrants, autocrats and dictators trying to hinder that. It isn't true. It's the other way round. The governments, trying to do something for the majority of the people, are persecuted by journalists who think that by having a pen and a microphone, they can direct even their resentment against you. They often insult and slander out of sheer dislike. These are mass media serving someone's private interests. Please, let the world know about what happens in Latin America. When I took office, there were seven national TV channels. There wasn't state-owned television. They were all private, and five of them belonged to bankers. As you can imagine, if I wanted to take measures against banking in order to prevent, for instance, the crisis and the abuses which are now taking place in Europe, especially in Spain, I had to face a merciless TV campaign aimed at defending their owners' interests, the owners of these TV networks who were the bankers. Let's not fool ourselves. Let's get rid of these false stereotypes depicting wicked governments persecuting saint-like and courageous journalists and news outlets. Often, Julian, it's the other way around. These people, disguised as journalists, are trying to do politics, to destabilize our governments so that no change takes place in our region for fear of losing the power they have always flaunted about. President Correa, I, I agree with your market description of the media. Uh, we, we have seen this again and again that big media organizations that we have worked with like uh, The Guardian, El País, New York Times and Der Spiegel uh, have censored our material against our agreements when they published it for political reasons or to protect um, uh, oligarchs like Timochenko from the Ukraine who was hiding her wealth uh, in London or big corrupt Italian uh, oil companies operating uh, in Kazakhstan. We have proof of this because we know what the original document contains and we can see what they printed and we can see what they have, have removed. But it, it seems to me that the, the correct approach to deal with monopolies and duopolies uh, and cartels uh, in a market uh, is to break them up uh, or to make it so it is very easy for new publishers to enter in to the market. Shouldn't you create a system that protects the ease of entry into the publishing market so that small publishers and individuals are protected and have no regulation and that these bigger publishers are broken up or are regulated? That is what we are trying to do, Julian. For over two years, we've had this debate about a new communications law aimed at segmenting the radio and television industry. We only want a third of all radio and television broadcasters 
to be private and profit-making, another third should be non-profit and belong to the community, and the remaining third should be state-owned, not run just by central government, but also by local authorities, municipalities and parochial bodies. The process has taken two years, and all this despite the fact that this order is part of the constitution approved by voting in 2008, despite the fact that the order was upheld by the Ecuadorian people during last year's referendum. Nevertheless, this new law has been systematically blocked by the big media outlets. The paid legislators they have in the National Assembly who defend their interests refer to it as the gag law, while the only thing we are trying to do is to make information and social communication and ownership of the media more democratic. But clearly, we face bitter opposition on the part of the media owners and their lobbyists in the Ecuadorian political arena. I spoke to the president of Tunisia recently and asked him, was he surprised about how little power a president has to change things. Have you found that? Look, they have tried to demonize even the concept of political leadership. One of the biggest crises in Latin America during the 1990s, at the beginning of this century, during the long and sad neoliberal night, was the crisis of leadership. What is leadership? The ability to influence others. Now you can have good leadership using this ability to serve others and bad leadership. Sadly, we have seen a lot of this in Latin America, the kind of leaders that take advantage of others to pursue their own interests. I think leadership is paramount, even more so during times of change. Can you envisage the US independence without the great leaders behind it? Can you envisage the reconstruction of Europe after World War II without the great leaders behind it? But in order to oppose these new changes brought about by strong and good leaders, they now denounce leadership as tyranny, populism and evil. President Correa, And this kind of leadership is all the more important, Julian. Please let me finish the idea when we are not managing a system. In Latin America and in Ecuador in particular, we are not managing a system but changing it because the one we had for centuries was a total failure. Because of it, we have turned into a region with the biggest inequality in the world, a region riddled with poverty and misery, yet having all it takes to be the most prosperous in the universe. It isn't like in the US. What's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat? I believe there is a far greater difference between what I think in the morning and what I think in the afternoon than between those two parties. <laughs> and it's only because they are just managing a system. But here we are changing a system and you need leadership, legitimate democratic power in order to change the governance structures and institutions in our country for the benefit of the majorities. It, it seems to me that President Obama um, uh, is unable to control these vast forces that are around him. Isn't this true for all leadership? And how is it that you have been able to change so much in Ecuador? Is it a sign of the times? Is it your personal leadership? Is it your party? What is the, what is the force that is permitting you to do something that Barack Obama is not able to do? I will first address your last question. The compromise, the consensus, is something desirable, but it's not an end in itself. To me, it would be dead easy to agree to this compromise, to this consensus, giving up, giving in, and it would make a lot of people happy, but it wouldn't change anything at all. It would please, above all, the powers that be in this country, but everything will remain the same. Sometimes it is impossible to reach a consensus. Sometimes it is essential to deal with things. Corruption, we have to deal with it. Abuse of power, we have to tackle it. Lying, we have to tackle it. Social vices such as these, so damaging to our society, we cannot allow.
What has been achieved in Ecuador isn't down to me. It would be wrong to think like that. It's people who change, it's countries that change, not just because of their leader. The leader might be the coordinator of this change, but by and large it's happening because of the will and determination of the nation. What led us to power was the outrage of all the Ecuadorian people. I think that this is exactly what the US people need for President Obama to make real changes in that country. This outrage, this Occupy Wall Street movement, this demonstration by the ordinary citizens against the system needs to become stronger, more organic, more permanent, so that Obama could make the necessary changes to the American system. I want to look at where you think Ecuador is going in the long term and where South America is going in the long term. It seems to some degree that there's, there's a lot of good things, you know, this greater integration in South America, the standards of living have been increased, the amount of influence uh, that the United States and other countries outside Latin America can apply to it is also decreasing. But where do you think it's going in, in 10 years, 20 years? You have said the US influence is steadily decreasing, and that's good. That's why we have stated that Latin America is changing from the Washington consensus to the consensus without Washington. <laughs> Maybe it will be the San Paulo consensus. Consensus without Washington, <laughs> exactly, okay? Y esto es bueno. And this is great, as the policies dictated by the US had nothing to do with our needs in Latin America, but were rather geared to the interests of those countries, financial interests in particular. If you make an analysis of the economic policy, modesty apart, I know something about it. At times, the policies could have been good or bad, but they all had a common feature. They all catered to the interests of the big capital, and above all, financial capital. And this, luckily, is changing. I have a great deal of hope, but I am very realistic. Although I know we have made significant progress, there is still a long way to go. I know that our achievements could be rolled back. I know that if we get the same people we used to have ruling our countries, everything could go back to what it used to be. But we are optimistic. We believe Latin America is changing. And if we keep on going down that path of change, the change will gain momentum. It's not just a time of change, we are witnessing a change of epochs in Latin American history. We have to go on with these sovereign policies to introduce economic policies where society rules the market and not the other way around. When society and life and people turn into merchandise, to continue to pursue justice and social equality, overcoming the many injustices of previous centuries, respecting our indigenous peoples and Afro-descendants and other minority groups. If we remain committed to all this, Latin America will have a great future. And it is the region of the future. We have everything it takes to be the most prosperous region in the future. If we haven't achieved it yet, that's because of bad leaders, bad policies and bad governments. And this is what is changing in our America. Thank you, President Correa. It's been a pleasure to meet you, Julian, at least in this way. And cheer up. Welcome to the Club of the Persecuted. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Take care. Don't get assassinated. <laughs> Thank you. That's something we have to avoid every day. <laughs>